Okay, hello everyone. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Welcome to Overcoming the Challenges of Filmmaking. So, my name is Daniel Skomorowski. I am 17 years old and I make films, or particularly one film, in Blender. It's a 10 minute short film. Uh, it's called New Man. Uh, I spent the last three years working on it, essentially solo, since I was 13 years old. I uh, finished it up. Yeah, finished it up just last January, but if you go watch it right now, you could still be amongst the first to see it. Um, <laughs> it's essentially uh, the last film I make. I don't plan on doing this again. Uh, this presentation is essentially why. Um, not, not really. When you, when you make a film, it doesn't always exactly happen the way you want it to happen, but um, there are tricks you can do to kind of get closer. I want to bridge this gap by bringing up a bunch of challenges that Blender filmmakers might uh, face throughout the way. I don't have a top 10 list or any organized structure for that matter, I'm sorry. Uh, and I'll just present it as a case study. Hopefully it'll make some sense. So um, just a little background. I've been using Blender for the past uh, four years since I was 13 years old. Uh, this is mostly personal, some client work. Uh, I like doing environment art stuff, uh, recreating shots for movies, all that. Uh, actually, recreation is a really effective way to learn Blender. It's also essentially plagiarism. But um, you make your own tutorial for a result on the fly, which is really the best way to learn. Um, actually, one of my first ever renders was me trying to recreate an archivist render by Roman Cogliata. It's a great guy. Um, a year later, I redid it to track my progress. Also a really interesting way to see how far you came. Um, it can be pretty fun. Just don't pass it off as your own. Um, it's actually kind of funny. All I would do was archivist renders. Bam, bam, bam. Uh, but it's actually pretty funny because you also get to see the one day I saw an Ian Huber tutorial and uh, my style completely flipped the ripping off <laughs> someone else. Um, but yeah, that happens, of course, at the very beginning. Uh, yeah, modern day, I try to do my own stuff. Um, yeah, but learning Blender is not something I need to cover here, I don't think. Um, but yeah, my whole film ended up totally being done in Blender, 100% modeling, texturing, rendering, animation, editing, and sound design in the old VSC. Yeah. Um, it's really the generalist approach, where if you don't know Blender coming in, you will know it coming out. Um, and Blender is very unique, I found, where sort of the master of none stigma dies off for generalists. Maybe the bar of quality differs sometimes when you have like single people churning out amazing people to work with just one software. Well, I think that goes to show. Um, okay, yeah, so a little background on my film. It's called New Man. I chose to do a fictional historical piece on the Soviet Union, you know, brutalism and all that. Um, which does have its pros and cons. Uh, pros, it's very nice because you don't have to make anything up. It's all available in like documents and photos. Um, it's even nicer for me because the city I chose to base it off of um, looks about the same as it did in the 60s, which is when my film is set. Um, but the cons are, well, you can't really make anything up. It's not something you miss until you don't have. You just have to have freedom to create anything. You know, make a road, great, chuck it in there. You can't really do that with historical pieces. Yeah, try to stick to fictional stuff if you don't want to be downloading reference images for sidewalks. Um, actually, fun fact, both of these scenes are in my movie, so I don't know what I'm talking about. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, plot-wise, I cheaped out a bit, just like this slide. Uh, I'm not a writer, and this project being hard enough already, plot is not something I was going to worry about. Um, actually, like, don't get me wrong. When you make a film, every scene kind of does work to convey some sort of story, but um, what I did was basically just saw the first 10 minutes, kind of like a cold open of this great HBO show called Chernobyl. I don't know if anyone's seen it. I uh, took out slices that I liked, and uh, yeah, well, that's my narrative. Um, my advice is to try harder. It's um, generally not the best way to do it, especially if you're looking for originality, but if you're just trying to make a thing, trying to advance your visuals game like I was, great. Uh, there are a bunch of short screenplays out there you can adapt, make a parody of your favorite movie, uh, music video, whatever. It's just whatever you do, make sure it's something you're really interested in, really interested in. You're going to have to kind of be obsessed with it to stick to it for three years, so good luck. Um, yeah, and there are plenty of other tricks you can do to provide a more kind of grounded perspective for a viewer that's not necessarily plot-centric. Uh, like I just have this huge factory set um, in my movie and um, as kind of like a center point of the city. So whenever I show a horizon and the factory's kind of there, uh, the viewer can sort of orient themselves in my world around it. Not really plot, but definitely helps build my world. <sighs> okay, so we're making a movie, making a movie in Blender. Where to even start? Um, well, I did it wrong. I started working on a film as my first large project like three months after starting Blender. Don't, don't do that. It's not worth the trauma, but um, 
just, just due to sheer luck, I got a couple things right. First, try to work as visual as possible when planning. I don't work very, you know, um, outside of like visuals anyway. My film, again, is about much more what you see than anything else. Um, yeah, so the first thing I made was these awful MS Paint drawings. Um, yeah, but if you can just get anything that gives you the general idea of what you're looking for, storyboard, block out, anything, um, then I say go for it. Just remember that Blender is also incredibly malleable for having stuff kind of look as you have it in your head, from your head to the viewport, kind of keeping that initial vision. I think that's super important. Um, like here are my final versions in my movie. Um, I think they're, yeah, they're pretty accurate. If you're gonna write shot descriptions, which I did a lot of, which is kind of just like a verbal storyboard, um, try to be as specific as you can. Everything from the most important part to the least important part, you know, from the focal point to the uh, focal length. Everything. Always start organized. I cannot stress this enough. You will not end organized, stuff like this, but it's good to stay professional by kind of imagining that you're not working for yourself. Sometimes two years into a project, you don't know what you did a month, you know, at the very start. Um, so, you know, if you're naming files, imagine a team will have to work with them. Um, I hate spreadsheets, but they actually come in handy if you're stressing about the sheer number of shots you have to do. This was mine. Um, yeah, it's super basic, just like, the four layers of my workflow, their status, some like descriptions so I stay on track. It's a little stressful because it's so much red. That was like probably the first year. Uh, it's nice and green now, of course. Um, yeah, but maybe deluding yourself into, you know, imagining you're doing a big high budget production is super good, actually. Uh, if you finish the shot, try to look at it as if a, it would be shown to a bunch of people, like in theaters or something. This will make your work seem so much worse. But that's the point. We're kind of gaslighting ourselves into perfectionism. That's the strategy. It works for some people. I liked it. Uh, yeah, don't take it too serious. You have to also stop redoing stuff at some point. Here, I'll bring this shot up for my movie. Take some water. It looks okay, but it also took me like a year of revisions. Uh, yeah, so here, let me show you. Here's how it started out. <laughs> Hated it. Our main character is previously in like a factory setting, so why are we just cutting to a city and it looks all fake and weird and everything is from textures.com. No shade from te no shade to textures.com. But um, oh yeah, and you're about to see the worst camera move of your life. Um, that was one of the first shots I ever tried. Left it alone for a couple months. I came back with this. It has a better idea of what it wants to be, uh, but still not doing it for me. Nothing looks planned or engineered um, or built by human. It's always like the layers of predisposed engineering that makes something look real. Ian Hubert, world building, you've seen the talk. Um, so on a flight, I sat down with a pen, I forgot paper, so I had to use like a barf bag or something, and started scribbling down plans like a crazy person. I came back with a concept of a plan uh, to, make, um, to make the shot actually work this time. For like a two month period, it was just diminishing returns in a blend file, great. Um, yeah, so you can see the time difference. Uh, I'm honestly surprised the first one took me two weeks. I never used to spend more than like a day on anything back then. That's uh, something you should overcome. Uh, yeah, again, Ineta okay, but was it worth that much time? Would it have been better to leave such a difficult shot for the end when my skills improved and I actually knew what I wanted the shot to look like? Maybe, and that's my point. You can actually really never know, and your audience won't either. Spend as much time as you want remaking the shot six times or adding the smallest details, but your audience only sees the final version. Um, you won't be able to rag about your process, like I'm doing here, to every single person in your audience. So try to make it worth your time by making it also worth the audience's time. Uh, focus on the final product. Your film is generally only as good to an audience as it is perceived by them. And it's hard. I, I love working on the small details. I love making stuff that only I will know that it's ever there. But it's also, uh, you know, when you see people finish two, three, four projects while you're still working on one, it's kind of sad, at least for me anyway. I lost motivation a bunch of times. I almost quit, like, completely two years in. Uh, but I always seem to come back. And that's because I think it's super important to take proactive breaks. I totally made that up. But it's still just staying motivated by still doing something, by still learning Blender. Uh, for me, a lot of the time, it was the opposite of depressing Soviet apartments. It was, uh, I did a couple botany studies, Monet's garden, whatever. Um, it was really fun. And after all the sunshine and rainbows, I was back in my timeline rotoscoping green screen footage. It was great. Um, I chose to do botany specifically because I know nothing about plants. Uh, the talk last night was tremendous for that. Um, 
so it was a challenge. I challenged myself to just keep learning and by still doing anything else. All these renders are done on days where I don't even want to look at my film timeline. I just go do something else. And maybe traumatizing yourself into creativity isn't the way to go, uh, but I found I just do much better work when I'm starved a little bit of that ability to make something new. I'll take a quick water break. I'm not used to talking for so long. <sighs> okay, VFX. Uh, we all know. Uh, if I still have some time, I just want to try a more in-depth uh, VFX retrospective, going over old shots and you know seeing where they got me. I'll start with this one. Uh, I've shown enough uh, bad shots for now. Uh, this one's actually one of my favorites. Um, I got pretty lucky here because the green screen we were using is only like two meters by two meters filmed in my basement. So um, we had to get kind of both of us at the exact same time. Uh, tough setups like that require good direction and VFX supervision, especially when both of those roles as well as acting is just you. Um, my buddy Jack in the back there is actually a really good actor. Acting in my own movie made me realize how hard acting was. All I had to do was like step forward, put my hand up. It took me like 10 tries. He did a first try. Put like the newspaper in the bag, sorry, the gun in the newspaper. It was great. Um, yeah, maybe hiring actors for to act in your movie is probably a good idea. Um, yeah, we had to coordinate the shoot pretty well, so both of us on the green screen lined up. Of course, you can fix it in post too. Once you know it, get good enough a blender and you can actually say, I'll fix it in post. Sometimes you will also just get lucky, uh, like this shot here. Uh, outside of all those effects you'll see on his face, this shot took actually very little compositing. Uh, I was dreading masking out. I, I used like a, like a light bulb I was just holding and also like my phone filming his face. And obviously there would be a reflection in his eye, but I got lucky. You, that's totally not edited, no masking, and you can't even tell, uh, even when you zoom in, I guess. Um, I also got lucky with these amazing 1950 propaganda newspapers I somehow managed to get, or this Soviet military uniform you could see I was very excited to find. Um, you can just get lucky, but again, that is very rare. Sometimes you'll make shots that look like this. Um, yeah, okay, listen. Uh, this was one of the first shots I ever made. Uh, it's still, yeah, it's not great. I tried to hide how mediocre it was by pulling the focus back, and now it just looks like a miniature. And uh, yeah, not good. The most important part about shots like this is after laughing at yourself for even trying to ship that, is how can I improve it? It's the mindset of what is the problem here to make it better rather than what shot can I come up with to replace it. It also saves you a bunch of time. Uh, so I tried a little harder. I redid the angle, did more greenery, and the animation works a little better. And uh, yeah, it's still not perfect, but I also want to finish my movie at some point. So. Um, there's this forgotten shot. Uh, I scrapped it where I was really disappointed, actually. It was one of those shots that you have in your mind for a long time, but it just doesn't turn out how you want. It's weird, right? I came up with the shot, then I made the shot, and then didn't turn out how I wanted. There might be a person to blame here, but... Um, <laughs> yeah, a lot of it was faulty prep. During the green screen shoot, I was kind of running around doing everything badly. And, yeah, I forgot the legs. Uh, also, the car model I made, I think I made it in like the first year, does not hold up very well when shot that close. Generally, try to remake any props if you're shooting close-ups, especially photo scans. Those are deceivingly bad up close. Uh, yeah, upgrading props is uh, super handy. Like, this is just the one example I'll bring up. I had this, like, tag asset I was using. For the first, like, two and a half years, that's what it looked like. For at the end of the movie, I kind of realized it looks like ass. So I spent 30 minutes redoing it, and it looks almost photoreal, I'd say. So uh, yeah, just sometimes remaking a prop is totally worth it. It might save your shot. Uh, yeah, so I ended up replacing that car shot with this one. Um, and just by changing the angle, same car model, and just shifting the viewer's focus away a little bit, I think it works much better. Uh, overall, I think my shot philosophy also changed along the years of making the movie. Um, because my green screen was so small, I was really limited in terms of just the elements I can shoot no matter what. So in the first year, I was kind of dumbing it down, shooting head-on like a mug shot or like a stage play or something. Uh, here, I'll show you. Yeah, this shot's a really good example of just having the character walk across in like the tiny little sliver. Hopefully, I like trick your brain into thinking like, oh, he's still in the scene because he just goes behind the wall. Definitely not there. My green screen is not big enough, so you can see like you're kind of tricking yourself into how much negative space you're showing. And shooting like that is kind of ugly. It could look a little amateurish. But during the second year, I kind of embraced it. I was like, uh, if we have the whole shot composition set up around the fact that we're shooting head on, 
like it's like a, a school performance or something. And like the character stands in the middle and I give it like that epic look. Uh, here, I worked for a couple shots. This one's pretty all right. Oh, and uh, sometimes I add a little bit that I know my fellow Blender users will enjoy, like um, interactive paint on a green screen element. Um, I find stuff looks a little more realistic when I haven't seen it done too often in CG, you know, like more novel stuff. Like I don't know the trick behind it. I haven't seen the tutorial for it. That was my contribution there in the back. Which is totally me acting, by the way. I play like six roles in my movie. Um, uh, yeah, this is what the green screen setup looked like. You can see it's all the way on the left because I had him walk in for two steps and that was like already enough for him to go completely off the setup. Um, yeah, walking shots are obviously impossible on a green screen. That's like two meters big, but I tried. <laughs> I was thinking of all these ways I can get him to look not awful, like I'm buying like a treadmill or roller skates or something. Did, don't do that. Yeah, so it was definitely a bummer. I say uh, be careful with walking shots because like, I even had him go off the green screen and I like, totally rotoscoped him completely and it still kind of looks fake. Like He kind of starts to walk, you can see it. Uh, that's something I could have done better. Uh, yeah, in the final year of making this movie, I decided I'm experienced enough to have characters interacting with their environment. This one was a pain in the ass to do, but it turned out pretty cool. This one's uh, obviously quite a lot of work, and but the impact of his hits don't really match like the CG object. That's my one problem with it. Hjalti would kill me, but I, tr I still try to film the green screen right. Um, like, yeah, here's the setup for it. Pretty wild stuff. Oh, and uh, I did some drawings too, the day before I was shooting the green screen. Um, <laughs> So just to give myself something to go off directing-wise, which really shows, first of all, that you don't need good drawings. Second of all, that you don't need to plan like super in advance. I found the closer you do it to your shoot, the more accurate it gets as it was in your head. Obviously, right? So um, yeah, same thing here. I like these uh, super close-up shots of my antagonist here, but these are like the only shots that turned up like almost exactly like the drawings. Oh, and I was super adamant about not forgetting that lamp in the third one. I totally forgot it. Uh, Another shot where I'm showing a relatively flat green screen plate, um, but this time through a digital object, incorporating it kind of better. Um, you know, kind of thinking about that digital camera in the digital space, like how do we shoot this if it was, if it was real? Um, also to kind of hide my sins. Um, this shot was super last minute, but if you try a little harder and figure out the green screen shoot in, uh, beforehand, you don't have to put a CG chair in front of your whole shot. But um, yeah, you know, here's the setup for it. I'm actually pretty proud of this. Uh, having a character interact with the object on screen works great to kind of involve the viewer. Um, because I'm shooting primarily silhouettes and the box, uh, the green box is smaller than the typewriter, it kind of, uh, I could just track it on top and you can't really tell. Uh, yeah, I'm pretty proud of that. Oh yeah, and if your character pulls out a CDG typewriter, might as well have them type on it too. Again, I'm just using a box here. Yeah. yeah. Uh, real low budget stuff, guys. Um, before uh, I play this, this is just a VFX retrospective I made, kind of for shots I already covered, some I didn't. Um, even with minimal equipment and minimal planning, minimal effort, sometimes minimal skill, you can achieve really good things with just Blender. Blender works really well to kind of, my, my thesis, to get it from your head to the viewport really well, just through pure practice and, of course, the software. Um, it'll hide a lot of your mistakes really well if you know the little tricks behind it. So, uh, yeah. I'll just narrate. This is the opening shot. I didn't show it. This was really a lot of assets here. It took a lot of work to render and do it properly. It looked horrible. I'll show like some past versions. What really saved this was reference. I don't think I attenuated that enough in my talk, but please use reference. Oh yeah. This is one of those like shooting up front standing shots, but um, I guess I chose to like move the camera around so it's like less obvious. Oh yeah. Uh, yeah, just a bunch of small details. Over time, you just learn how to incorporate reference actually better because you can have all the reference in the world. You'll see it later. Even with good reference, if you don't know how to use it, it might not be that worth it. Oh yeah, here's the big shot. Every movie needs a cool, wide, sweeping CG shot. Yeah. 
Yeah, so you could see I was using reference all the way at the beginning, but just because my skill wasn't up there, I didn't know how to use it properly. Don't overestimate reference, but also use it. Yeah, how many Ian Huber assets can we fit into one scene? And then, yeah, I come to my senses a little bit. Uh, yeah, this one's just like a nice little close-up, one of those shots that don't really give a lot of plot, but, you know, just nice to show. Old lattice trick on the wheel, just kind of look at, uh, make it deflated and adjust to the terrain a little bit. Works great. Uh, here's a shot I didn't show. It's a little dark, I'm sorry, you can't really see. But I used uh, the Bagarain, um water simulation to get, like, the, the tap that, like, me shirtless is uh, bathing in. I put like a sphere through it for the physics object. Thank you. For the physics object. Um, so it kind of looks like a yeah, interactive. Oh, yeah, if you're going to make a movie in Blender, might as well add moths, yes. Of course. Uh, yeah, here's the car shot. I show um, a little of the environment more. Uh, classic filmmaking, set your whole film at night so you don't have to show the environment at all. But uh, I still ended up working on it. So yeah, here's it in the daytime. Oh, yeah. And then hide all those details never to be seen. Perfect. <laughs> yeah, here's the green screen plates, also done separately. Works pretty well. Here's one of the only set extension shots I did. Just This is shot in the house, put like a shelf in front of like the all unrealistic stuff. Oh, here's the final shot in my movie. Coordinated three entire green screen plates together. They time up pretty well. I don't know how I did it. Sheer luck. Yeah. Spoiler alert. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, before we end it off, I just want to give a quick thank you to everyone who helped me along the way to make my film possible. Definitely does include everybody at Blender. Thank you so much. Um, that code is just for my art stuff. Uh, also for my film, if you actually want to go see it. Uh, yeah, go ahead and... and uh, Take your phone out. Um, yeah, if you still have no idea what I'm talking about, my film's up there. Uh, it's just 10 minutes of your time. All right, cool. Thanks, guys. <laughs> One thing, um, because technically we have like a lot of time, uh, we can do questions if anyone has any. Okay. Yeah, I integrate a lot of live action performance into green screen stuff. Um, you should actually look into tracking that, getting mm -hmm. to track that, which is a, another topic. But have you found, and I saw your images, um, uh, sorry, I lost my voice at the karaoke yesterday. Uh, have, have you found that you need more bit depth for your cameras? You, you said you did it on your smartphone. And, and yeah, it so I shot my whole movie on my phone. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. So um, generally, yeah, get anything better than your smartphone, especially because it's an Android. Um, yeah, a lot of the time tracking and rotoscoping was just a nightmare because everything is so like blotchy and pixelated. Mm. Blender does not like keying smartphone footage. Did you key right everything right. in Blender? Sorry? Did you key it in Blender? Everything? Yes, okay, nice. Thank you. Uh, if anyone else at the back there. Can you pass it in the back? Uh, I think you mentioned in the beginning that you are not going to uh, create any more movies, and my question would be, how so? Um, generally, because I just uh, have other, like, you know, career aspirations outside of filmmaking, definitely a good backup plan, but also because this took uh, three years of my life, and um, I, got, I got traumatized a little <laughs> All right, thank you. <laughs> now, uh, like... First, more serious answer, just generally because I have other interests a lot of the time. Uh, if anyone else, the back there. Did you photo scan any of the assets that we see to match the reference? Yeah, a lot of the like sidewalk stuff was just gotten from my town. I don't live in a place unfortunately that looks like 1960s Soviet Union, so I had a hard time. 
A lot of them were from Ian Hubert, I've mentioned. A lot of them were assets of, sorry, photo scan assets of people who played in my movie. Whenever I'm doing like faraway shots and I just want them, the characters, but I'm not going to film the green screen plate. Yeah, photo scan your actors. Hey, thanks for sharing all that. That was really, um, really fantastic and all the work you put into this. Thank you. Um, I guess one comment and a, and a quick question at the end. The comment, you, you mentioned that you got lucky a lot, like 10 or 12. I don't think, I don't know about Instagram, I don't think it was luck. I think you just worked really hard <laughs> at it. It's part of it. Um, I think it favors the people that, that really put in the effort. So um, just a note um, Thank you. on that. And I guess the other question, I'm not even sure how to frame the other part of this. It, so you've been working on this in, since you were 13, yeah? So that's a, that's a, that's a quarter of your life. <laughs> yes, sir. I'm, I'm almost 50, so a quarter of my life would be 12, like 12 years. So I'm, I'm thinking back to when I was 13 and going to 14, 15, 16, 17. My, the things that I cared about changed. Like my world was getting bigger, and I, I presume similar to you, yeah? So at any point during that time, did you think like, I'm making the wrong move, I don't care about this anymore, or like, I, yeah, I, don't, oh boy, I want to do I know something those else. Words, I don't like, care anymore. <laughs> uh, yeah, so do you, I, I mentioned, I, I, I almost completely gave up like two years in, uh, but I, it's kind of like the sunk cost fallacy, as much as it sucks to say. A lot of the time you finish projects because it's like, oh my God, I put in so much time already. Um, it's also just because I wanted to see a final result. Working on it so hard and still, because I definitely did not do this film in order. Uh, kind of having like a scramble timeline and not getting like that satisfaction of a final uh, goal was, you know, it was really, it really sucked. So I think as I went on, I really, I never got disinterested in Blender, more so as time went on. So I really noticed my skills started to get better, better, and better. So it's kind of, as I put more time into it, I have to progressively put less like shit work into it. And it just gets kind of easier to make a higher quality product. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I think uh, that's everyone. Yep. All right. Cool. Thanks so much, guys.